Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities. In this podcast, we interview thinkers, researchers, activists, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities and how to reduce their, their environmental impact in a socially just and context-specific way. I hope you enjoyed your summer holidays. We're back, and today we will talk about a concept that you all know uh, and that it has been used by all of you in, in one discussion or another. Uh, in fact, I think it's probably one of the most widespread concepts to quickly discuss about all of the challenges or all of our environmental challenges put together. This concept is the ecological footprint. To talk about it, we have today the co-creator or co-founder of this concept and the author of Our Ecological Footprint, um, Reducing Human Impact on the Earth, a book I, I read, I think, a decade or so ago. Uh, I still have some notes and post-its on it. <laughs> uh, and uh, the author is Matisse Wackernagel, uh, and Matisse has co-developed this concept during his PhD at the University of British Columbia. Since then, he has received numerous awards. Uh, of course, the one of the nice ones that are attached to our work is the one of the Worldwide Fund for Nature Award for Conservation Merit, the Herman Daly Award from the U.S. Society of Ecological Economics, the Kenneth Balding Awards of the International Society for Ecological Economics as well. Um, but aside from all of this work, uh, uh, Matisse has co-founded as well the Global Footprint Network, which is a think tank that develops and promotes tools for advancing uh, sustainability, including the ecological footprint and biocapacity, which both measure the amount of resources we use and how much we still have. So with all that being said, welcome, Matisse, and thank you very much for being part of this podcast. It's awesome. Thank you, Aristide. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks a lot. Um, could you perhaps give a, a brief intro of yourself? Uh, I don't know if I've pictured you correctly or not. I don't even know myself. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I grew up in Switzerland and I was born in 62. I think something very striking for me, there are a number of striking things. Which one is my parents and grandparents talking about World War II and the resource constraints, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean, Switzerland luckily didn't have much war action, but, um, but the, the food constraints was a dramatic thing that people remembered and the rationing at Switzerland only had like seven months of food per year. And so the, the relationship between resources and, and, and our lives kind of, that was a constant story we heard about. And also wondering how can Switzerland have such a high income and not having resources? That puzzled me always, particularly I, I spent some time on a farm as a kid, like in the, in the, during the vacation, kind of walking behind the farmer and kind of learning about how the farm works. It was just fascinating. And, and then wondering why do the farmers like they send all their food to the city and get back very, very little, you know, and are looked down upon. It's very strange, but it's so dependent on food and they're such nice people. And then, and then we were hit by the oil crisis, not just Switzerland, the world in, 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 in 73. And um, Switzerland reacted very heroically with three car free Sundays. <laughs> which of course is wow. ridiculous. Yeah. It's ridiculous three days you know, <laughs> compared to like the amount of fossil fuel use. But as a child, it was just eye-opening. It was because back then pollution from cars was really stinky. I mean, it's horrible as a child and then the cars that took over the space and we could for the three days bicycle anywhere we wanted, even on the highways, you know, it was, it was fantastic. It was quiet and our parents talked with, it, with, with their neighbors, which didn't happen otherwise as much, you know, so it's kind of, it was like a popular party. And for me, The idea of a fossil fuel free, free future seemed so tangible and attractive and, and inevitable. As a child, I thought, oh my God, I'm sure it's going to take a long time. You know, I'm sure it's going to take at least five or 10 years. Um, but um, now I'm here. <laughs> Little did later. we know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really years later. And we're still struggling with similar ideas. I mean, the ideas have progressed, but so has our consumption i mean i think the, the 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 percentage of fossil fuel use now is still about the same as it was in the early 70s has moved a little bit but very little overall just that the consumption overall is far far higher and like in halfway through in 1992 we had the first 
climate convention. That's a long time ago. <laughs> and still, it hasn't shifted that much overall. I mean, there, there's some interesting trends. There are more windmills. The, the, the price of uh, renewables is coming down, etc. But in terms of transforming how it depends on fossil fuels, it's, it's quite stunning how far behind we are. Yeah, and I can imagine that this is the, the slight game between hope and frustration when whenever you have like a big climate summit or whenever you see something happening like a crisis like with the one we we're with you know inside of it or outside of it depending on how positive we are and the ones of you know the ecological one before and you think that yeah as you said in a couple of years time all will be over all will be well but then we keep in this perpetual let's say uh i don't know a loop Uh, where we learn new stuff as well. Uh, I think we, we get out of the loop and then we, we get back to it somehow. Perhaps it's a spiral uh, a spiral, and not a, a loop uh, in some kind. I think one, one, one big issue, the, the way where we are so stuck in the loop is that even like from the environmental side, we have chosen a narrative that is not very helpful. And I think that narrative is too much based in, in painting the global challenges as our personal problems. Mm. And that, or another way of saying, the more technical way of saying is we see it as a tragedy of the commons. And so, oh, wow, it would be really nice for humanity not to be in that situation. But what can I do? I'm just such a small speck. You know? so, so, so how nice can we be to the world? And that even goes to the nation's level. I mean, to have climate negotiations you wonder and say what are we negotiating about you know it's kind of how nice is switzerland going to be to the world that's a very strange question that's the underlying question of the un convention it's the other way around i think the the, the challenges we see in the world that's our context that's the context we live into and the question is or rather how will switzerland be able to operate in that world Like what's Switzerland's ability to organize itself? It's kind of a much more necessary for the country and the country has a government. We have a sovereign in Switzerland. Like we, could, we, could, we could decide and we do as if it was about how nice, like are we doing our fair share compared to the rest of the world? It's really strange. While actually we are at stake, you know? So, and, and, and the interesting thing is with any problem, if you react well to a context in a, in a way that increases your chances of winning, you do things that also are good for the whole. You know, so it's not, so, so if, you, if, you, if your strategy is to do something that makes the situation even worse, the likelihood on average that these strategies fu function are very low <laughs> because not every, it's not replicable. But all replicable strategies that help you cope with that context also benefit the context if you're very worried about the kind of shifting out the context. But primarily see yourself, wow, If I'm not ready for the future that we can anticipate, I will not be ready. And it's strange because the future, I think, has never been more predictable than it is today. Never. Like we know that people will want to eat and sleep and be housed. We know that exactly. We also know that there will be far more climate change and resource constraints. The question is how much more, depending on obviously some of the choices we'll make over the next decade. But there will be more climate change and more resource constraints. And given that, And demand will go up possibly too if the population trends continue like we see them today. I mean, the, 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 the um, reproduction rates are coming down, but also we're living longer, you know, so it's kind of, there are, there are all these kind of trends. And, and so, so we know the storm that's going to come. Why are we not preparing our boats? That's the question, I think. And, <laughs> and especially that, um, you know, before, because we were not outsourcing most of the issues or, you know, our, Our economies were much, I mean, their hinterlands were much smaller. Uh, smaller. We, we could more or less still postpone the problem to the future. And now the outsourcing of each country touches upon the other one. So there is, yeah, absolutely. you know, mm -hmm. there is this Venn diagram where m <laughs> almost everything overlaps <laughs> and we, we don't have any more move to, to uh, any more space to move. Yeah. That's I mean, space, sp space and time overlaps. Mm. I mean, you mm -hmm. work on cities. Cities have huge time delays. You cannot turn a city around in one day. Like it takes, like most of the infrastructure, particularly higher income cities will have in 2050 are already built. It's not going to be like totally transformed. 
so and but the speed at which the future comes to us is much bigger so i think the time like how quickly we get into that future is shorter than it takes to adjust our infrastructure so we actually would it would be very helpful for us to run much faster in some ways so economically i think yeah. economically the case is very very clear only that we don't see it because we believe still in continued expansion which in the end destroys our wealth so from a wealth perspective it's it's, it's fueling a liquidation policy or what what in english it's called a ponzi scheme a pyramid scheme or i think sometimes it's called a snowball system where where you live like you pay the the old investors taking from the from the from the fresh investors you take from the future to pay for the present it's illegal in all domains but ecology and ecology is much bigger than the rest we are a subsystem of ecology so it's very strange that we encourage a ponzi scheme we i say now we but i think that the way most countries operate is kind of based on policies that accelerate the Ponzi scheme, while in other domains, financial domains, it's actually illegal and people are put to jail. It's very odd. <laughs> yeah, well, the legally binding element, I think, is one of the central ones, right? I mean, as soon as we will have some, it's the same thing with commons. In yeah. commons, you yeah. have laws and you have, normally you should have regulations and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, pun not punishment, but, some, you know, there. Yeah, I think legal is not leading. Leading is following. So first you have to have yeah. the sense that this is what the right thing is, you know, so so it's not, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and it's more attractive, th that's for sure. Than, uh, it has to, it has to get, first, I think first you have to have the recognition that this is really hurting us. And then, I mean, the laws are not just kind of formalizing this understanding, but the understanding is still widely lacking. And I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Yeah. I'm puzzled by it. And <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I think your concept is one of the, the ones that really helped bring this to the forefront. I mean, the complexity of, you know, a thriving society or a thriving humanity needs. Mm. Uh, needs resources uh, needs somehow to capture its emissions and needs to to balance it out with what the planet can provide so we have like many pieces of the puzzle together and you brought one concept to reunite these let's say three pillars how how would you define or when you were thinking about this concept how did you arrive to the, the term let's say ecological footprint so i mean the concept like we 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 thought about these things for a while the next i think it was kind of a, a great luck like bill bill reese got a new computer and the people told him that wow this has a small footprint on your desk oh yeah that's a good that's a good way of doing it but i think that the idea that the biological we, we we were both intrigued with carrying capacity because animals obviously it's it's, it's quite established the idea i think there's only so much an animal population that can be supported by a certain region, for example. And does it apply to, to people? And I think the biggest mistake that people have made around that is to ask the question in a speculative way. Like often you hear the question, how many people can live on the planet, for example? It's a, it's, it's a close to useless question because it's by nature speculative. You know, because, oh, but it depends on like how much, like, you know, but if you turn the question around, it becomes totally descriptive. Like not how many people could live on a planet, but how many planets are people using right now? It's the opposite question, you know? And then it becomes totally obvious. Like that's, I mean, it's, a, it's, a I mean, it's a descriptor, it's not a speculation about the future. And, and people still think we make speculations about the future and we have strictly just done bookkeeping, accounting. <laughs> <laughs> what actually is being used compared to what's being renewed. So, so I think the, the, the underlying inspiration is perhaps the insight and maybe that it's inspired by my, by my um, childhood on like vacations on a farm that in the end, every country is like a farm. Actually, it is a farm. How big is the farm compared to what it takes to support that country? You know? And a farm, I mean, so, so waste and resource demand, they can be synergetic, 
or they can be in competition. If there's too much waste and actually you destroy ecosystems, but, but I mean, the manure from cows, this goes back and then it actually increases the fertility of the pasture. <laughs> so, 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 so all, all the demands in the end, they do compete for what nature can regenerate. You can you can choose to build a bigger farmhouse, and then you, and that's probably in the flat part of your farm, and that that's that would have been a very good garden or field, and so there's no carrots growing there, <laughs> or you know so uh, and um, you can you can the older days farms used the, the forest for fuel wood, you know, or you could or you could if you use fossil fuels then you need space to absorb the CO two. You don't need to, but if you want to maintain natural capital, so accounting essentially means it's capital maintenance. Like, what's the flow needed to maintain your capital? So, if you use more fish, then it's being regenerated. It's like using bigger fish stock. If you cut more trees, they're not being regrown. It's like using a bigger forest. If you emit more CO two, then it's being absorbed. It's like using more capacity of the biosphere to absorb things. And funnily enough, you know, when we started people laughed at us for putting also CO2 into the equation of saying, this is a competing demand. And now, I mean, now we know because, because like people sell reforestation credits for CO2 reduction. I mean, this is a very strong, <laughs> so the, the, the limitation of fossil fuels, and that wasn't as clear back then, is not so much because of how much is on the ground. There was still some hope that actually there will not be enough on the ground, so it will come to teeter out by its own devices but actually the, the amount that we already discovered on the ground is far exceeding what, what the biosphere could meaningfully take on with that kind of massive massive change in climate um and and uh, i mean there were much higher co2 concentrations in the beginning of life <laughs> but there were no humans around there were just some bacteria that could kind of start to turn um co2 into oxygen but um or, or some some algaes but um some algaes rather um so, so um so, so yeah, it's, so people laughed and said, "Why do you put fossil fuel in there?" Like, it's, it's ridiculous. And then by two by the thousand, suddenly everybody moved just it's only carbon. Yeah, correct. the carbon footprint. And I was, people probably have more heard more about carbon footprint now. And the carbon footprint, it doesn't even make that much sense. Carbon footprint, if you already think about it, what's the kind of carbon footprint? And how do you? <laughs> so uh, when you see it in the context of all the other demands on nature, it, it, it may make sense. I mean, it's great that it was pushed so much. It was pushed also very strongly by fossil fuel companies. We were all, always a bit afraid of that. I don't know if in net positive, if it was a net positive or net negative, it's not, the term is more used. It's also more accepted. Like, I don't know if you remember in the early 2000s, people in the, in the, in the fossil fuel industry were not allowed to talk about peak oil. Even though peak oil, peak, there's no mountain without a peak. It's a mathematical thing. There will be a peak, but it's just a question of when, you know, it's like, it's like, it's, it's not always <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a mountain without a peak. Sorry, um, but but that mathematically consistent term was was not accepted. But the carbon footprint is is kind of accepted, but obviously more meaningless. And we say actually it's helpful to look at the whole everything that competes for regeneration. Because yes, the carbon footprint has become larger and larger. And that's the reality of our life today. But also driving it to zero. Where do we get the metabolism from? Like, are we just going to, like, people would want to fry their chickens, so would so they just chop down more trees? Or, I mean, like, so, so, so we have to look at the whole and also recognize the whole. We may not be able to use the whole because there are other wild species too with, with whom we compete. Like, the seal eats a fish, I cannot eat that fish. And vice versa, the fish that I eat cannot be eaten by the seal, you know. So, so, so there is competition between human demand on what we could say, what's the, 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 the limiting factor for the human economy, which from our perspective is regeneration. Regeneration becomes kind of this common currency of everything. So, so, so what we offered is more kind of an interpretation framework and say, how may it be helpful simplifying to look at the world, taking out as much speculation. We're quite, I think, I, I, like we can go back to limits to growth, like seeing one part that kind of made them so vulnerable even though it's an amazing book, I mean, you, know, you can read it today. How many books that like do technical analysis you can you can read? And nearly fifty years later, and still say, "Wow, yeah, yeah, wow, yeah, it's amazing." <laughs> Anyhow, so so, but because by nature, talking about the future is speculative, and so so you can never win an argument. You can. Will there be gravity tomorrow? I don't know. 
we can only find out tomorrow. You know? So <laughs> I mean, that's kind of how you, <laughs> will technology save us? It's an unsafe, I mean, you can, it's a ridiculous question because we can never agree and that by, by, by keeping the argument alive, it's unsettled. And so we can maintain business as usual. So there's a lot of interest in maintaining business as usual even though it's actually hurting us collectively. And that's what, what we haven't seen. And we can go into why that is, why we have become so blind to our physical existence, so blind, particularly in the social sciences. Um, and it, it's, it's, you talked about this, the Venn diagram. I mean, the Venn diagram is a, is a picture of what some people could call kind of colonial thinking, you know, so, so that you can always get more from somewhere else. That's, a, that's the essence of colonial thinking. And it's it now... You, you, you will find it anywhere. I mean, I, I think kind of this whole trend to urbanization is based on a colonial thought, you know, that you build cities without concern whether there is actually the resource security to maintain these cities. So, 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 so oh yeah, we build it and, and we can buy some from somewhere. But if in net terms, we use more than what can be regenerated, how long can you do that? And, 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 and I think we haven't focused enough in our work also to look at the, because we look at kind of, if you look at financial parallels, we look like at the flow situation. How much do we uh, like use compared to how much is being regenerated? But we don't look at the capital stock. It's much more complex for natural capital to say, hey, what's the capital stock? And, like, and, and, and to, to track in, in, mean, in meaningful ways. I mean, even from a data perspective and conceptually, but there you can look at the various stocks. You can look at our fish, fisheries, okay. <laughs> are the forests, okay. Um, and the atmosphere. I mean, if you go from 300 to 305 ppm CO2 equivalent in the atmosphere, who cares? You know, so it's kind of like, um, like the impact, like it's minimal. And the, but if you if you make the same addition where we are right now, actually last year, according to U.S. government, and 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 most students I ask that they even study environmental science haven't heard that, but even the U.S. government measures now how many ppm's of CO2 equivalent do we have today in the atmosphere, and the last measure, like the last kind of accumulation of all the greenhouse gases as of 2020, is 502. 502. So if you go from 502 to 507, you know, in other five, that's very different. <laughs> so it's like when you with money, if you like the first little debt, like, oh yeah, I still have like more assets. So I, I can, I can overspend a little bit, but once you're closer to bankruptcy, you know, to add an extra $5 or five francs of spending, <laughs> it's dangerous. So it's dangerous. So, so, so on the, from the capital side too, I mean, we are starting to see the brittleness of the system and so we believe because we could overspend in the past we can overspend in the future while we're now entering a totally new era i think that's that's what what's not recognized and and somehow that's kind of puzzling me as well with i mean climate change is more recognized now it unfortunately strengthens this narrative that we talked about of saying oh it's just about this global commons what can i do which I think is a misrepresentation of the whole dynamics. We can go into that as well. But it, 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 it kind of has strengthened, again, what I would call the electromechanical mindset of just, it's just carbon, not even seeing carbon in the context of a biosphere, you know, so, and how it competes with everything. And so I think we, 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 it, it leads to solutions that are not really helping other problems as well. So we're kind of solving one problem at the, at the, at the, at the help of another one I could go into into uh, dramatic examples if you want but in the end I kind of, that's kind of the <laughs> I think the misconception that we're even more removed from the biological reality sometimes we call it I would say it's like the, uh, the things in English expression you know we focus too much on the last straw that's breaking the camel's back <laughs> and then th that obsession gets us think about what's actually the total amount of straw on the camel's back so 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 we don't have to be worried so much about popping pointing fingers at who is the last straw we just need to remove remove straws <laughs> that, that would be more helpful <laughs> yeah. but but i'm wondering so let, let's go back to Jean matisse that left switzerland so mm -hmm. you did a mechanical mechanical engineering degree yeah mm -hmm. at eth and then yeah, mm -hmm. you went to british columbia to do your Correct. phd yeah mm -hmm. and so i guess your appetite for 
for calculations came from this engineering background and somehow you know only uh, yeah 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 i was i was fascinated like i i always laughed loved math so i'm i'm my poetry is math you know <laughs> numbers speak to me i can look at numbers but oh, your wow. your phd and, is in regional planning regional or community or, planning uh, regional yeah. and community yeah. planning so, so essentially it's, it's it's i probably wouldn't allow it to be saying that but so, so i i started first mechanical engineering because I thought technology would change like things much more. And I recognize it also has to be the social side and regional planning is probably the closest to something we're not allowed to say, but it's like social engineering. Psst, don't tell anybody. It's like, it's the question, how do you turn knowledge into action? You know, it's not just a theory of Habermas and then somebody has great ideas and then we drink coffee and bullshit around, but it's actually, <laughs> it's totally applied. How do we use knowledge to generate shifts? That's the that's the core idea, and perhaps planning has not been as accepted in in the, in, in I mean it was in the Western world generally because it was like the communist planning that was like in the Cold War. Like I just I started my PhD just at the end of the Cold War, and then in in the in the in, in the Germanic languages probably because of World War Two kind of the, the fascist planning kind of super state was also not very welcome and then the commonwealth somehow because they weren't associated with fascism apparently and you know it's a, and everything and so so they had that that function so kind of keeping the cities beautiful so the, so, the, so the commonwealth tradition is pretty strong in planning and and and, and, and alive so where it's going beyond just kind of making houses nice in, in the city but it's actually truly kind of thinking more fully about it's a policy program now it's mm -hmm. probably called public policies in other in, in other places but it was just at the time when the Brundtland Commission had written its For the Common Future, so, so when sustainable development became much more a topic of the global stage. I mean, it had started in 72 with the Stockholm Conference, but then the term sustainable development got enshrined in, 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 in public pardons. And back then, everybody said sustainability is too long of a word. It will never catch on. Nobody like the companies will never use it. It's kind of, it's, it's too, it's too complicated a word. <laughs> uh, and, but the stunning thing was the, 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 the effort they took to make it complex and, 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 no, and not measure it. You know, I thought, oh, they just haven't found out how to measure it. <laughs> because why do we have sustainable development? Because we only have one planet. And, and, and so how much do we use compared to how much we have? Like how much do we need to do? I actually told my mother, that's what, I, what I'm studying during my PhD. And she got very worried. She said, this is such a simple question. I'm sure others <laughs> have done it. You will not get your PhD. <laughs> Be worried. <laughs> <laughs> because her brother started his PhD on something that somebody somebody else already worked on, and then he had to kind of start again in a different direction or something. So she was <laughs> she was worried about my well being. That, that's so that's so that's too simple, um, and it's still kind of yeah. It's, it's, so 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 I think I've learned a little bit more that the confusion around sustainability has has more actually system. It's not it's not really lack of understanding or lack of intelligence or anything it's it's actually it's amazing the the intelligence and the sophistication we as a species perhaps not as a whole species but particularly as kind of the well endowed part of the species <laughs> the urban elite around the world is putting into this cultural complexification to maintain business as usual so we can feel good about oh yeah we're thinking about it without having to act but you don't have to act. That's the whole thing. That's kind of the misconception. Um, uh, nobody has to act. The question is, would it be in our interest? I think it is. I think that's the conversation that's missing. To say, if we build cities that depend on resource flows that will not be available, we build ourselves a most dangerous trap. And because the time scales are so short, if you actually truly did a net present value assessment of our cities, you would recognize that economically we are destroying ourselves. So it's not some sophisticated analysis, but it's kind of this total misconception that we only look at flows. I mean, it's a GDP focus. The worst about the GDP focus is not that we say, oh, money is the only thing that matters. But I think that the fundamentally worst is that we only look at flows and not at stocks. So we say, hooray, we produced 100 Swiss francs, and we forget how many hundred dollars we actually lost in assets to produce these hundred Swiss francs in, in some ways. And, and, and so, so, so resource costs are so diminished, so small for, I could go into reasons why, 
like Cape Town didn't pay much for water, you know, and then Cape Town runs out of water, like they didn't fully, and they find out a solution, whatever. But I mean, it's it's much more difficult if if a city runs out of water, the whole city is worth nothing. You know, so it's, so so it's not about the value of water. That the, what, what did the city pay for water? That's nothing. <laughs> it's what are the implications of not being resource secure? Then everything becomes zero because the economy, as we know, is a subsystem of nature. So, so not having, not being able to be a subsist means you don't exist. It's not the other way around, and that means you lose all value. And that's a bit of an expected. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's uh, <laughs> it seems so obvious when when you say it like that. So, it? But <laughs> why? I mean, after <laughs> let's say twenty five years of uh, when when the book came out, mm -hmm. um, so you've probably seen so many different people use the concept and. People mm -hmm. have seen the value of it in order to understand this complex issue. And yet, I mean, we've seen also that since the 70s or was in the 70s that we're now using more mm -hmm. than what the yeah, earth can, can provide. Yeah. Um, so we know that, right? And yeah, I mean, the message was totally not like we failed in, in explaining the message. That's why I also have shifted things. So, I mean, one thing is to me, biocapacity is the bigger chapter. And footprint is a piece of that. <laughs> no, it's kind of, but, but by capacity is the lens. And by capacity is not even understood that much. You know, that's kind of the, the importance of regeneration. That's that's one part. The the and then even bigger, I mean, the whole reason why we went into this is is the concept of overshoot, the possibility that you can use more than what the capital <laughs> regenerates. You know, we can overshoot financially many have done that uh, we can do it ecologically and still the word overshoot barely exists I, I just actually that's why we started earth overshoot day as a way to explain the concept in ways that has is, it only uses two syllable words apart from the word january and that's what i'm most proud of <laughs> that it could be so simple that from january first so january that was a three syllable word from january first to this year july 29 people have used as much as our planet can renew in the entire year you know no three syllable word apart from january so so primary school children can understand and say wow and then it's not just understand the idea oh we have used more than what there is but even there's a even though we didn't put that much of a number in it people think it's not a number but actually there is a clear number <laughs> because primary school students will say, wow, it's still a long way from Christmas when I get my gift. <laughs> and that's still not the end of the year, you know, so, wow, it's, a, <laughs> it's a still, it's a, there's a lot missing. So there's a lot missing. So, so to bring the, the piece overshoot in, but then I just did some media analysis to say how are the terms actually picking up and the Earth overshoot day is picking up really nicely. I mean, not as much as Beyonce or kind of, you know, or, or <laughs> we look for. <laughs> yet, but, yet, but yet. it's, it's, but it's, it's, it's <laughs> but they're, they're, they're quite, an, I mean, I think we had about this year again, 6,000 me, media articles that are documented, like on the web that you can find. And, and it's hard to say what the impressions mean, but this media search, they kind of translate into how many eyeballs have the possibility to see it. They may not have, have seen it, but have the possibility, have access to kind of these platforms. And that's, uh, so they come up with 7 billion in the end. You know, so it's kind of, so, so it comes out. But still, and then if, if you look for the term ecological overshoot, it barely shows up anywhere. <laughs> like, so, so, but ecological overshoot is the big topic. <laughs> Earth overshoot day is just one way of kind of talking about it. And so I think that's kind of where we are struggling so much that we have a huge disease, I would say, that we say overshoot is the second biggest risk humanity faces in the 21st century, because the biggest risk is not to look at it. You know, so that's so, so it really kind of, it, it's, it's, it's quite humongous. And then you go to a doctor and say, I feel so sick. And they say, sorry, we don't even have a word for your disease. You know, uh, I, 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 let me look it up. Oh, somebody said overshoot, but not even a therapy, of course. You know, so, so it's kind of it's hard to translate the word in other languages. I mean, we have now established some translations because we have an international <laughs> campaign, but it's not it's not common parlance, even though it's the underlying thing. And that's kind of going back to back to the to, to the camel idea. You know, so the, we focus so much on, on the many straws, and we forget kind of the underpinnings. It's, it's quite stunning, I find. I don't know. Mm. 
and uh, so why do you think overshoot? Is it just because it's two syllables instead of ecological footprint? So you have ten of them or something <laughs> like that, that it that it was uh, accepted even further because ecological footprint was already very much uh, accepted. But now overshoot, you say, is much more than that, or that's the word that existed used. before. This, yeah. this, 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 okay. this, this, this is a big theme of. I mean, others have talked about it. There's a big ecological study and kind of the Lotka Volterra cycle, you know, kind of the. And then, so um, footprint just kind of captured the imagination because it put together like the, the sense we leave an impact, but also space that, that we actually use space. Mm -hmm. That space ultimately, I think, is the ultimate like com competition ground. I think modern economics tries, to, particularly at the non, at the macro level, tries to avoid. The idea of competition. I mean, OECD that drives GDP has it its name, cooperation. Mm -hmm. and, and that the, the biggest discussion I've had with many economists is you cannot say we're competing, we're helping each other through trade. Trade is only net positive. And, uh, and, and, and we are attacked. I mean, we are so much attacked, much more on, on implications than on the tool. We call our approach pedestrian science it's a bit of a joke because you know the footprints pedestrian science but it is totally pedestrian I mean, it's high school science we just add up everything we use according to how much regeneration it competes for because then when it competes for you can add it up you know things that are overlapping you cannot add up but things that compete for you can add up so it's I, I mean, the principles, it could be more basic. It's more simple than money accounting. Money is more complex because you have, like, you have to distinguish between profit and revenue, you know? So it's kind of, you know what I mean? So like, if you, if you, if you get money, actually, the, you also have to think about how much did it take to make that money? So it's only kind of the value add. So, so calculating GDP, is, it's more sophisticated. Like, which flows do you have to account for? Material flows, the way we do it, it's, it's much more straightforward because we can add up all the things that compete for space. So, so, so that, I mean, if devil's in the detail and get to get, how to get the data and we use the UN data sets and they're probably flawed, but they're, you know, internationally accepted, use about 15,000 data points per country and year. It's a lot and it's not a lot because the country is a big entity, you know, <laughs> but um, so, so it's, 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 it's super pedestrian, it's super simple in the end, not, not that complex. Why is it so hard to kind of be seen or, or, or recognized it's 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 very interesting i think i mean that's why like we say so it takes it's, it's a probably underestimate switzerland takes four and a half switzerland's to support itself and the finance ministry in switzerland thinks that's irrelevant to switzerland's long-term perspective so i don't know it's, it's <laughs> funny because um I don't know it, whether it's your background in, in planning that has land as the ultimate denominator of, of, of these or, or something else. Well, of course, on the planet, we have limited amount of square meters, right? Uh, be it of mm. land or, or ocean. So that's yeah. one of the things that we have limited elements. We have other stuff, but yes. which are unknown, like reserves, uh, resource reserves or mm -hmm. how much CO2 we can put in the uh, in the atmosphere. We know I mean, that the CO2 that's linked to the square meters. I mean, so, so that's why we said we, we map it to the surface of the of the of the planet to the, and then to the productive part. And of course, the biocapacity can change from year to year because we can like the way we manage it. And as the the world gets probably hotter and wetter, it could, it could well be that the uh, productivity of the planet is going down or becomes more erratic and so so agricultural yields will not be as steady you know so or so 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 we're not saying everything is static we're just bookkeepers like how much do you earn this year how much do you spend this year and then we do translate into like for every year we know the surface was that much and the productivity was that much so so it's it's i mean it's a it's is, is your budget limited? Of course it is. It doesn't mean that next year you may earn differently. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's the same idea. And I think that's, for, for some, that's not, it's not inspiring. But it's like, this, like I say, biocapacity. It's like gravity. You know, an architect would say, oh, gravity, I hate it. I would like to build my pillars differently. And down, I don't yeah. want to fall. I don't want to follow <laughs> gravity. Say, good luck. I mean, um, <laughs> <laughs> so so architects fully embrace gravity 
I haven't heard much many conferences where architects go to where they kind of argue about gravity. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, I mean, it's it's interesting to see that. Um, well, space I think speaks a lot, and when we talk about cities, mm. which is a weird, a weird human invention, which is let's say a place where, by definition, uh, survives because of surplus of somewhere else, right? I mean, cities were and cities' jobs exists thanks to, let's say, agriculture that was once outside or that a surplus of land that exists somewhere else. So I don't know how you feel about, you know, dealing with cities in general. Do, do you have you? Well, I, I can imagine that you have done a number of studies with, with cities, yeah. but what is the, the at the end, what, what can we say to, to, a, to a system that it's by definition the unecologically uh, sound, let's say? From a GDP perspective, an economic perspective, Canada would be much better off if it just kind of said, let's keep Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver and unincorporate the rest and give it a very give it away because you know, so that's where the GDP happens. So so we have can produce much more GDP, much more effort. Let's just have Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal and get rid of the rid of the rest. If you actually took economics seriously, that would be the logical conclusion. <laughs> And it's perhaps just of sentimentality that they're not doing it. They're, oh, but the land and yeah, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so the economic system is so skewed to urban areas that they can suck the 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 the, the, the value add out of the entire system. We did one one thing that's most shocking insight I've had in the last few years, which I could have had early if I just kind of made the diagram before, is the following. And I still haven't resolved. I don't know actually. I mean, I don't know what it. I, I have, I have implication what it means, but it's the following: in lowest income countries, typically over fifty percent of the GDP and the workforce work in agriculture. Let me say lowest. Let's say country under two thousand dollars value add. So we just looked at that because it's like agriculture is really so significant, you know. So then I also would say, from my experience as a boy being on a farm, if you have a bigger farm, you can have more cows. They have more throughput and they could buy a more shiny car. <laughs> so, so a bigger farm helps you to have more productive capacity and earn more money. So applying these two insights, I would say, oh, wouldn't that then say that those countries that have more access to buy capacity per person in the low in that field would logically have like be better off? So we made like just a, you can do it yourself. You can use our buy capacity data. You can use our you can use the world bank's GDP data. <laughs> you cross correlate, and what we found is a total cloud with slight negative correlation. Actually, even kind of <laughs> laid, laid, laid a line to. So even today, with massive massive overshoot, because the overshoot we are in right now, okay, we can document seventy percent more than what is being renewed. But the UN data set doesn't even document like all the destruction, like soil loss, et cetera. So it's kind of, you know, so it's probably not all demands are, are captured either. And still at 70% more. And little detail, we're not even arguing we should use the entire planet. There's like so many other species too. So E.O. Wilson says maybe half would be a much better goal, you know, for maintaining 85% of the biodiversity in the world. Maybe we should just use half. So half compared to 1.7 fold, that's more than three fold off. So we have a, you could say that we are, we are three, our metabolism, our biological metabolism is three fold larger than what a sustainable level could, could imply. Like that, that kind of also would be biodiversity. It's also probably good for climate if we were smaller. And prices totally do not react. It's stunning. So, so if prices react, then the market will react, and then we will adjust gradually. That's the soft way. If prices do not react, and the system does not react, like with the water in 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 in, in Cape Town, then you have disruption. So we're in a total disruption course because our system, the blindness of our prices to that reality, make us not react. And I think also 
as as our as our worldview has moved more towards a mechanic or electromechanical perspective, and that's driven also by our city experience. We don't even realize our biological dependence overall. I think we put too much emphasis in, oh, let's look at the resources, oh, iron ores or lithium. Oh, is there enough lithium? There's plenty of non-renewables on the planet, I think. It's just a question how dig, how big holes we dig, you know, so and how much energy we have to concentrate. So yeah, I mean, there's also the limited, I'm not downplaying it, I mean, so we have to carefully manage our other resources as well. But I think the misconception is not recognizing that the so-called renewables are even more fragile. And I think many urbanites, they have, oh, renewable, it's fine, great, renewables, good. let's just do all renewable and then we're fine. They, actually, renewables can be the more significant for us and they are more fragile. Yeah, because once they're off, they're, they're done. Yeah, you know, they're potentially you know. renewable. It's like the golden goose is renewable. <laughs> if you kill it, <laughs> you know, the, the goose that, that like, lays the golden eggs. And, um, not a very good biological metaphor because it does as gold was much better, much more important than biological thing. But so anyhow, so, so it's an underappreciation of the biological cycles. And, and that's what I, I, I hoped actually that we would, we would find the recognition of our biological existence far more in, in the COVID situation because COVID obviously tells us we are biology and by biology we are connected with each other biologically. Um, and somehow that insight has not become that much stronger, I think, a little bit stronger, but not, not, not to the extent that, wow, biology really matters. You know, so, so anyhow. <laughs> so, so you've been doing this let's say accounting work for 20 plus mm -hmm. years, right? So actually that's more than 30, more than 30 years. And you've done it at different yeah. levels. You've done it yeah. at the global level, yeah, yeah. at the national level. Yeah. You've you done it at the cities. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. you've done it to the city level as well, but I'm wondering, so is there something, uh, so over the years, you also probably see that, uh, the amount of pressure we put increases, the, probably the bike capacity also decreases a bit or at best remains stable. Um, is there something that you've seen that still was surprising, something that you could have never thought of it while, while looking at all of these data for, for years and years and years? I mean, there's so many surprises. I That's why I love working in the field because... <laughs> I've worked for 30 years. It seems to be the same question and I don't get bored. Like it's, it's like, it's more puzzling every day. <laughs> it's more puzzling every day. I mean, on, on, on some level, it's kind of how to think about these aspects. I mean, to, to what extent, I mean, it's more also what happens in the world and how we think about it. Like, for example, we just did a rough study about Australia, which has been, um, um, it's very large by capacity compared to its population. Just, because of the, the, the population is not that large. It's a fragile continent. Then we did a, a rough calculation about the forest fires in 2020 and say, if we include that and say like, how, if, if that's actually a loss in biocapacity, you could have negative biocapacity. I mean, if you have, a, if you, if you have a forest accumulated and you lose that, then it takes years to rebuild it. So that means it's like you overspent that year. So your, your, your assets went down or your assets went down far more than you had income. And so actually for that year, Australia became an ecological, or started to run an ecological deficit. So the net law, the net use of biocapacity, or including the loss they had in their capital, exceeded, you know, what 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 was regenerated. Wow, that's shocking. That's a kind of like a place that that have has extra. You never capacity. thought this could happen, yeah. you know, <laughs> theoretically. Just, this, and, yeah. and so quickly, like this, yeah. the scale of the of, of this thing. The the other thing is, I mean. It's, the UN data sets, I mean, there's more the surprise of kind of the blind spots that doesn't have clarity around loss of soils, you know, or loss of, of, of water, fresh water that, that leads to agricultural loss. So we're still seeing the doped athletes. So by capacity seems to go up using UN data sets. Well, in reality, probably it's, it's not the case. It's kind of, we're just erring on the side of not exaggerating the situation. So sometimes we say tongue in cheek, we are more worried about our reputation than about global survival because <laughs> we don't want to exaggerate the situation. So overshoot is probably underestimated. So, I mean, I mean the, 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 the surprise is also kind of on the data set, for example, 
with four, some four is now becoming net sources, apparently. You know, there's more and more studies coming out, like is the Amazon becoming a net source of CO2. So, so forest productivity obviously has a huge impact on the on the carbon balance. But when you look at FAO data, it's like a static number at best, like how much a forest is able to generate. And I'm sure they're changing in productivity with more forest fires and pests, and you know, so, and it's it's not being tracked. Um, and, and 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 it is kind of this focus that we think monetary wealth can buy us everything. And, and so an Angela Merkel, for example, I'm sure, just to take one example, she's more worried about the stability of the euro than the stability of the, uh, the soils in Germany that are able to produce potatoes. You know? And that's probably true in, in many countries. And, and that's kind of the, the wild thing about how, how powerful we have made money that it can move around so easily that we trust money more than physical assets, which are more difficult to trade and, 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 and exchange. I mean, if you have a farm, you cannot just take a little bit of the farm and can buy a cup of coffee. You know, it's kind of it's, 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 selling a whole farm is very complex um, comparatively. So, so there's this huge advantage. And I think Herman Daly said it best. I mean, the challenge becomes and with, with debt creation, there's no limits to negative pigs. You know, I can promise you the pig for the future, even if it doesn't exist. And so you can infinite amounts of negative pigs. And then we start to realize, wow, there's not enough pigs to, cap, to, to kind of cover the, the negative pigs we promised each other. Yeah. And, and, and so, so that's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> the pickle we're in <laughs> that's not a surprise in some ways i mean it's just it's but it's it's the surprise is more where does it resonate this year i was, was very excited i mean one of the highlights of earth overshoot day was that financial times had the graph of overshoot day over over times as, as, as their main graph on the front page upper fold it's awesome and uh, and and the number of phone calls we got was amazing too because <laughs> it like it was zero. <laughs> oh, really? So, <laughs> yeah, zero phone calls in January. I mean, I'm not surprised. That's, that's what happened. It's, it's kind of it seems so apart from the logic. Of, oh, how interesting! What do I do with it? I don't know what to do with it. Let's continue. <laughs> like, even though it's actually the actionability is quite straightforward from my perspective, but I think it's it's. it's so, I mean, we work with some companies, but I think for so many, it just, they know kind of what the way they operate just doesn't fully fit with the, with the, intuitively. And so that it's so daunting to them, which is strange because they have to, to deal with a lot of daunting things. And so understanding your context, understanding the situation allows you to make bets that are much more likely to win. You know, if you if you if you if you bet blindly, every decision is a bet in the end. It's a bet on the future. It doesn't serve you. I mean, it seems like so obvious. But so so so, so I'm a little bit. That's so this is kind of the puzzling side. Is I think it's the, the the social side. I think more like how we are addicted to a noble narrative. We talked about that. And I say addicted because it's to be righteous, you know, so say you're wrong. <laughs> it's so satisfying, perhaps, or, or the urgency, we call it the, like the urgency makes it, makes it. But in the end, the question for me is like, it's not like for cities, that's what, as we work with cities, the question for the city is not how nice can you be to the world? That's kind of how we approach it. The, the question is why is Basel, where I'm from, destroying Basel? That's the puzzling question. What does that mean? But like, are you committed to your own long-term success? If you know how the future comes to you, what would that mean? Would that mean building more parking garages? Is that like the best use of your money? You know, so, or like, what would it actually take to be successful? And do you want to be successful? Why do you think this future is not going to come quickly? Because, I mean, the future, there are many different paths, but they have a lot of aspects in common so we could say oh maybe we will not decide to get out of fossil fuel fast enough you know let's see what the others do if we don't then we'll have to deal with more climate change which means more disruptions more difficulties to get our food more resentments around the world less like higher price to have a global trading system and you don't have the resources locally, and you haven't prepared yourself. You have become like you have the totally wrong assets. 
or you can sweat a bit more and prepare yourself early and say no matter what we'll have to get out of fossil fuels even if the others don't actually the, the, the faster we are the more we are prepared because our systems will be able to operate in that future the future is regenerative whether we like it or not that's the only possible future it's actually a certain future it's going to be regenerative the question is how quickly we get there you know, that's the other thing by design or disaster that's the that's the choice and i think we always think is oh sustainability is an option it's not an option it's the <laughs> it's either with us or without us that's the only yeah. thing yeah. Yeah, or yeah or, i mean it's not totally it's but not even that binary i mean but i mean it could shave off a big percentage of the of the global population i mean there may be that the, the buy capacity may be so much lower than that the budget is so much lower that's going to be much more difficult um for, for a large population to to operate i don't think that the human species will disappear very quickly i mean o overall but it could be a, a very significant very significant shock so you touched upon very briefly about actionable elements mm -hmm. um you mentioned companies so what type yes. of how, how does this work so let's say there is a, a company or a territory that uses these principles and how do you mm -hmm. Do they use them to make them actionable? Do, do you have some yes, examples, perhaps? Absolutely. So, so we are, we're, we're working quite closely with Schneider Electric, for example. They mm -hmm. are in the business of, let's say, digitization and decarbonization. And somehow they recognized, luckily, they have a great CEO, Jean-Pascal Tricois, who was an engineer as well. And, and they can recognize, wow, we are actually a force for sustainability. We don't have to greenwash. You know? So it's actually what more Schneider better world because we need to electrify the world and we need to decarbonize the world and decarbonization and, and electrification needs digitization to kind of manage the, the energy flows etc and so they actually look at how much carbon it takes to operate schneider compared to how much they act they, they reduce in the world are they getting better at helping the world decarbonize <clears throat> and through that produce value for their clients so it's one of the few companies that fully embrace sustainability they're not just saying oh it's about sustainable development goals there are 167 indicators we contribute to to three of them so we are part of the game yeah. <laughs> so, so so no it's, it's actually essential like so so they have been able to to say that maybe did a little uh, kind of uh, booklet with them on, on it, which which I thought was quite intriguing. That it's not about how nice are you as a company? Do you have a CSR department? Rather, it's to say, are your goods and services contributing to humanity success? Because if they are, your markets will more likely open. If not, they will more likely close. Now, it's not the only thing that determines success, and it's but it's like playing soccer on a field that goes downhill. You know, they may still be messy on the other side, and then you know, <laughs> and even uphill, he will win. You don't know, but but it's it's it, it, on average, it makes life much much easier. And that's it's such a simple question, and few companies have embrace it. So it's, so so I think because we we approach the question too much from a kind of a normative perspective, who is good, who is bad. I mean, even people say, what's the footprint of a company, which is scientifically, I think, a totally nonsensical question because companies don't have footprint, it's activities that have footprint. So the question is like what like, like what activities do you want to look at? So it's like a functional thing, like with money, you have to say like what's the question that you actually want to address rather than making up kind of ways of calculating things nilly willy <laughs> that are not based on the scientific principles or a clear sense of relevance i would say so so that's um i, I think how, how we work with with, com with companies or cities i mean it starts from the question of saying like we want to help you kind of be successful are you committed to your own success that's kind of the driving question or the underlying driving question and if so then it's awesome to work with them, you know, to say like, and for a city to say like, what does it, what does it actually take to be long-term successful? Like what, what do you want to invest? What do you not want to invest uh, that, with companies? Like, um, I mean, so it's pretty, I think it's pretty straightforward. So once you recognize that the straw on the camel's back and say any reduction of straw kind of takes pressure out of your system, like how, what does that mean? And so some some cities now that's not because of our work but i, I know for example where i live berkeley like they're saying we are taking the gas grid out of the city 
we will not have a gas grid in the future. We have to electrify it. And so, so the argument is to say to people, you don't want to be the last ones to have gas because otherwise you, the, 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 the more and more of the costs of the whole infrastructure will be burdened on you. Yeah? The earlier you can get out of it, the more you shed yourself from these kind of costs that you don't want to be part of it. So, 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 but that's not the conversation I hear very often around, like, around the world is to, to, to bring the, the stranded asset conversation far more kind of practically into people's view. Hmm. Which is also the problem of, uh, you know, government cities and all of that, which do not own necessarily much of what they are dependent uh, yeah. uh, upon. Yeah. Like uh, sometimes infrastructures, they don't even know them. Uh, sometimes the lands, most of the cases they don't own. And so, you know, it's this weird situation of how do you, even in committing in your own successes, um well cities what can they really do sometimes they only have let's say uh, a fraction of the land a fraction of of the the infrastructures themselves because they had to outsource everything so i would i would say i would challenge them and say they can do more if they want to like right? every yeah, city yeah, is yeah. different <laughs> and and the, and, the, and the legal situation it's not just the, the more but i think one is kind of to be clear from which framework to operate. If that's the organizing principle and say, we need to get our city ready. And, and, and the citizens, they, 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 are, they, they are mad for every fossil fuel dependent project that is kind of added. And, and the fossil fuel dependent project is to add houses that still need like fossil fuel heating and cooling or like and, and whatever. So, so they're not well built or adding more parking infrastructure and, and all, all these kind of things. So, so about how like the, the the zoning power and kind of their their development permits, etc., um, yeah. can also shape in which direction we go. So, so if if the citizens think, oh my God, it's like this kind of development is destroying me, you know, so th there's a different type of energy than they're saying, oh, we want to be a little bit nice and have like more green points <laughs> associated with our with our city. Or where, where do you? I mean, where, where do you see kind of the metabolism interest of, of of cities? What 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 do you find like what what resonates? With, with 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 cities well from your, from, from your experience I, I, if from what i've seen is that a lot of cities are confused from what they'll get once they do the study or once <clears> they <throat> they've accounted for their flows they think that there is you know the keys to paradise that are, they're going to be <clears throat> handed off to them as <clears throat> soon as they're going to perform this study uh, whereas it's very much as you said once you do any type of accounting then you also need either a clear vision or a clear commitment to something. And mm -hmm. then your action plan or your strategy roadmap will come after that. But unless you have like a clear idea of, yeah, we want to not harm the, the environment anymore at any cost. Well, of course, your strategy and roadmap will be completely different as if you say, okay, we want to, uh, I don't know, uh, reduce the amount of waste coming out of my city, which is another metric, right? I mean, getting uh, reducing the amount of waste can also be by exporting it and not uh, treating it locally or et cetera, et cetera. So I think a lot is lost uh, in the translation of things after this quantification story. They don't have yet all of the possibilities in their minds of what they can do, what they should do, and all of that. And of course, the different layers of administrations don't help, and the different, you know, uh, politicians that come for a short amount of time, whereas administrations are there for a long amount of time. There is this duality of time frames, which often hurt. Like every politician comes with a vision; they come, I'll, I will do the circular economy. The next one is going to do the, I don't know, the green economy. The next mm -hmm. one is going to do the other economy. <laughs> um, and Inclusive. I, the, yeah. <laughs> new name yeah mm -hmm. but um at the end of the day they just reshift or rewarm the plates in the microwave but they, they mm -hmm. haven't you know made radical change or they, they 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 did not measure as well they didn't have an indicator at the beginning of the political vision say are we circular or i don't know what the term is mm -hmm. how much are we today and how much did we become at the end of the mandate mm -hmm. so isn't there also a step before kind of to understand 
what's actually what, why is it relevant to us like what mm. i think for information that's kind of something i learned painfully there's like three parts one the, the the first part is, is more question now as we see kind of in politics the first one would be it has to be accurate obviously otherwise it's not like it can be found out so it's going to it has to be on, on a scientifically sound basis i think it's probably still in the long run because things are being found out so you can you can maintain lies for so long but not not forever you know so anyhow so it's, it's helpful <laughs> I think I still believe in the scientific method, <laughs> having a clear research question, and, and then, and then obviously, to make that useful, it has to be relevant to people. Mm. So, so why, how is it relevant to you, like in some ways? And then the third one is the most difficult because many things are relevant, but maybe we don't like so much, you know. <laughs> so, so, so how do we how do we also make it empowering? So empowering to say that actually with this information you're better off and and that's, so, so i think how we embed it is so is is so important i mean we have yeah so, so, so how, how do you how do you engage with cities so they feel they're stronger having that information well we, we, we tried we, we tried yeah, a little sure, bit but... like with, with, because ultimately i think the tension but there's so many names around it like in China, they call it ecological civilization, sustainable development, or I think the, the essence is we want to have thriving lives, and there's only so much physical budget. And I think the phys most physical budget is the regeneration. That's kind of the tension we're playing. So, I mean, donut economy is what talks about that, or like there's so many aspects. We did some diagrams with, with, with countries and saying, okay, let's, let's look at what's your social outcome. And you can use a number of measures. For example, use the Human Development Index. You know, that's a social outcome. How many resources does it take to produce that social outcome? What's your risk exposure if you use more than what's available globally? I mean, you, you, that means you bet on forever being able to outcompete others. You know, that's kind of is that is that a stable bet that you always will win the world championship forever? You know. <laughs> I mean, some are confident that they can, and for some it may work out, but it's just, it's not that replicable and, and, it, and it puts fragility into your bed. And, and then you can, you can track and you can, you can make the point right now, this is the city where it is right now. How is it moving over time? You know, so how is it moving over time? Uh, and, and, and is that, is that helping, is it making you strong? So if they say, yeah, that's what we want. That's great. What what we what we see kind of as, as limitations is often, I mean, our numbers always come with delay because that's almost kind of, of a course. delay and then they're outside of the administration's probably time frame. And oh, that was the last administration, even though they don't budget that much <laughs> over time. But so that's kind of one way that goes out. And then the other thing that people get frustrated, I wonder actually how you deal with that, is they feel, oh, we make so much effort and it doesn't budge the needle. You know, this is kind of, it takes so much. And in reality, if you think of it like from a, from a physics perspective, actually the things that don't move the needle much, you have to do even earlier because, you know, if it, we, we cannot adjust, if it's so hard to adjust, we cannot adjust in the last second. So it actually makes it more urgent, not less urgent, but in the political rationale, the needle not budging that much is a discouragement. So it's kind of the, the, it's the opposite of what actually is needed for a city to succeed. And so how to translate that in something that, that, that I mean, we have some, some some ways, but I think that's kind of typical ways. I wonder how your experience is with that, that kind of the, like the metabolism it doesn't change much. No, but, and you're right. I mean, the, let's say in the, in general, the flows of cities are, let's say energy, food, uh, water and construction materials. These are the big ones. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's no, magic right i mean you reduce the amount of buildings you reduce the amount of construction materials and energy and water uh and you switch your diet from one to another you switch the environmental impact of food mm -hmm. so i mean th the answers are there they're pretty straightforward and all of that however i mean to implement them it's a massive thing because you need to change consumption patterns you need to change uh you know companies and adver advertisement and all of that etc cetera, etc cetera. and you piss off your voters and you pissed off everyone you know i mean that's a... <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think what they want is like small short-term wins like what what can we really do that still makes sense and that is 
a small landmark. And so we had this small thing. So we, we did this uh, study seven years ago, uh, almost uh, for, for Brussels. We, we mm -hmm. measured all of the flows entering, exiting the stock and all of that. Um, so we did a big, big picture image, and then they asked us to zoom in some flows, some very tiny flows, let's say, because they thought that might be, let's say, a, a, an interesting solution or something that they could work after that. And one of them was the, the wood uh, flows. And Brussels has a, a forest uh, down south, so has mm -hmm. the Zonian forest. And by I, I called the, 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 the forest stewards to understand how, how does that work and what happens once they cut off the trees uh, because they're sick or because you know they renew the, mm -hmm. all of that. And they said, well, actually, most of them are bought and leave for Asia or China. Oftentimes they come back in Brussels as, you know, as furniture, but furniture. that's, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's funny. I mean, you would never know that unless you ask these people, this tiny piece of information. And it got more or less buried for X amount of years. And then I had a colleague of mine that took this on with, with other people. They created a cooperative and now they buy this wood locally and try to repurpose it locally because there are no sawmills anymore and all of that. And of course, as soon as the politicians heard about these initiatives, everybody really pushed themselves towards it because it seems like a no-brainer. Uh, so, you know, you take, I mean, you don't export to China, you reuse locally, you create local production, uh, it is your own biomass, etc. I mean, it, it only wins in on any front. So I, su I think this was one of the things that, you know, a tiny contribution of, uh, of such a study could perhaps help. And, and people, as soon as you, you ask this to any Brussels citizens, they all would say it's a fantastic idea. There's no, uh, you know, no one would say no. No, it, no one loses that has a say. Only yeah. the Chinese lose, but they're far away, so they cannot. <laughs> they cannot. <laughs> so if you find these tiny pieces of success somehow, uh, and either you export them, so you showcase them from somewhere else, because mm -hmm. of course this exists in Montreal, this exists in Amsterdam, this mm -hmm. exists in many countries. Um, so perhaps you showcase some tiny examples that get your citizens and politicians, uh, well, together into one thing and then they move on once you have one victory you can very easily move to another one and then another one um but yeah That's i don't awesome. know if that makes sense or not yeah yeah mm -hmm. to to us kind of a, a litmus test in the end is i believe i've seen ministers sweat when they hear like bad news about oh unemployment goes up i mean you see like this like and I'm sure they don't sleep that well. They have heart palpitations. I think like there's there's a somatic expression of kind of this whatever bad news is, you know. So that means they have internalized it. They say, "Oh yeah, this really means something." And it's I don't know if you, you probably know the book "Thinking Slow, Thinking Faster." You know, so so so, so we need to learn like these abstract things, like for that unemployment is bad. We need to learn, and then we know that, and, and then it's deeply in us like if you ask a child what about unemployment they say oh hooray then my dad is home and then we can play <laughs> together you know so you know what i mean <laughs> so so it's not in itself obvious what what it means i'm not, I'm not belittling unemployment but i'm just saying we have to learn that it's a bad thing and then we know and then and then we when you say, oh my God, it's a really bad thing. And, and I think we are at a place where kind of overshoot or, or kind of an ecological deficit of a country doesn't produce any sweat pearls on any minister's forehead or heart palpitations or anything. And not that I wish heart palpitations on ministers, <laughs> but I mean, it's, just, it's, it's a sign if it's not there, it's just a bit becoming, more than now, you know, <laughs> not, it's, not it's, <laughs> it's not becoming actionable. And, and, and one way of knowing it is are your economic plans, your competitiveness plans, do they see resource security as a major axis that you need to be ready for? And that it's not the case, you see it, I mean, it's, it's, it's just one of the documents, but for example, the World Economic Forum, which is fairly influential, they have the most influential report is the competitiveness report, I would say, what they kind of say, which countries are really kind of like, <laughs> good there. 
they they somehow add together with no scientific principle, obviously, because it's like indices, I don't think have any scientific validity, but they're being published in academic journals. I'm not sure why. But anyhow, that's another story. So so <laughs> so, so they add up this kind of index for competitiveness, use a hundred plus um, indices, uh, indicators. Not one of them has any physical dimension, like not like energy, nature, whatever so for sure not biodiversity not even water like nothing food nothing it's like as if like economies floated in space i mean the only physical thing in there is number of airports but um, <laughs> <laughs> so so competitiveness that i wrote with them like isn't that about kind of long-term productivity you know and isn't sustainability about long-term productivity like isn't there a bit of an overlap there like like, like I, I don't know so, so I'm not. I'm just. I'm poking fun at that one. It's just. It's a manifestation of kind of this this schism. Um, but I think that's kind of in, in in some ways kind of the you know how do we how do we exactly really core? It's not just a nice thing. And on Sunday afternoon we go and visit and say, oh, this nice windmill, you know. So, it's, but it's uh, it's <laughs> how we recognize that resource security is something really fundamental in some ways and so I, so I mean that's why we have worked with, with countries and then also with cities we have now a project in Portugal with about 20 cities like kind of looking at their metabolism and and and, and the, the difference between rural area, rural cities more rural more kind of metropolitan cities and the resource dependence and uh, and still struggle to be totally honest of saying like because it's the, the economic rationale just still does not digest that reality yeah and it's 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 it is surprising and and yeah so. i mean today there's not the solutions do not make sense in a term of economic uh sense uh that's why a lot of you know well but when we yeah but when we now talk with with, with regions and they say oh we want we need a climate plan so you don't need a climate plan you need a competitiveness plan but a competitiveness plan that recognizes the world we live in. Yeah, and a how can it be a competitive yeah. plan? You know, not a five-year or, or even twenty. Yeah. I think and because I mean because we need to move out of fossil fuels pretty fast. You know, so. sure. Yeah, yeah, but uh, so, I think so, that there is uh, like the bio capacity that we would like for for instance to build yeah. up again. I think yeah. this is like a probably more yeah. than twenty so, years. They, yeah. But the point is, I mean. I think scientifically it's clear. Like, like mm. actually, I think I'm not sure why IPCC continues to say that we can be at 1.5 degrees by kind of moving out of fossil fuels. Already, the concentration we have in the atmosphere today puts us in a two degrees track, even if we stop today. So, okay, maybe we have, we have net sequestration in the future, but where from? Because we also then don't have fossil fuels, so we need other in inputs. So, so I, I just don't see the pathway kind of so clearly physically that we can't, we can say we can move down. But I think there's no argument that says we can wait for long or like we, we should, we can still <laughs> use fossil fuels beyond 2050. You know what I mean? So just, just want to say, it's got a very fast track. Everybody born after 1985, you may be in this category, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody <laughs> born after 85 will still be in the workforce in 2050. So it's not like, oh, it's, it's not if you, in your work life, you will have to kind of retool the economy to <laughs> something quite different. Not have to. I mean, that's kind of if, you, if, you, if we want to maintain some level of positive you know, life. Mm. So, so 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 it's actually it's so much it's so much closer in some ways and so 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 it's so so we're already now destroying our net present values it's not about kind of the long-term planning so much it's kind of with every decision we make right now i mean what we build today most likely will be part of our infrastructure in 2050 sure. most likely yeah yeah hopefully otherwise we're in the, that's, it's even worse because then how will we have the money to kind of totally rebuild what we already built today you know yeah so so and i know so that's kind of the the time frames i mean that's kind of what what time time and space is missing in the social theory since world war ii for a number of reasons but that's kind of this idea oh the market will kind of see it and then we adjust hmm. it hasn't for a century <laughs> there's, yeah. there's physics here <laughs> yeah yeah 
yeah that's so, probably also yeah yeah good sorry mm -hmm. no no I'm, I'm just wondering so given all of that um <laughs> I'm, i'm wondering how you move forward so let's say in 2021 so you have this project with uh the the portuguese cities mm. do you have any other project that uh you hold dear to to your heart I mean, we do a lot of kind of thing. We, we, we do quite a bit in the Mediterranean. So on like on, on ecotourism, on food consumption, uh, we're, we're just now starting a, a new project just on food, the future of food. Uh, I think on energy, it's clear. It's not easy and we haven't made much progress, but I think it's conceptually at least clear where we need to go. On food, it's even more stunning because the implications of the new word for food we call it the eight impossible imperatives that are hitting us you know on food and just, it's just a little bit tongue-in-cheek but i mean it's just so many things happening in terms of like farms don't get much money and that's not going to change they should be able to operate without fossil fuels and fossil fuels is now so essential to agriculture the way we run it i mean including just the, the amount of plastics that are being used <laughs> that alone but i mean it's not just the plastic it's kind of the fertilize the tractors the pumping and etc the 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 the, the The, the production chain like keeping food cool and like there's, there's so much there's there's so much that takes fossil fuel and then they should even become net sequestration like but but i don't know where how they would be paid for it you know so and, and they should actually produce more food because there'll be more people and you know so so the, the list of the imperatives that are hitting them and they'd be less polluting overall and then the biodiversity threat i mean just Like Switzerland, for example. So, so it's kind of that's so we'll be working with Wageningen University on a, on a on a larger project to kind of see how, how can how can food become one plant compatible? What does it actually mean? You know, so and 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 then how could we shift things? Um, so that's fascinating. Um, then I've been in conversation with a number of places that that I mean that want to do like carbon neutrality, whatever. And, and then we have this honest conversation with them and say, do you really want carbon neutrality? I mean, is that what you really want, want, want? You know, so, because if, if, you, if, you, if you have it as a conditionality, like uh, you do everything as we did, and then also carbon neutral, you, you get into this impossible competition between reducing carbon and paying for your schools and the health system that is fragile. And how can a Dominican Republic, I mean, allocate money for that you know so you have to, that's why you need to think totally out of the box and say how can a dominican republic be successful in the long run given the world we're in like what's your economic plan that has to react to this context and then it becomes more meaningful and i think that's kind of people say oh oh yeah that's true because this this is such a like this 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 making environment a conditionality rather than the underpinning Of, of, of long-term success. I think that's kind of the shift we are, we are trying to speak into. And it's very slow in some ways. I mean, so it's, I'm, I'm fascinated and entertained by the projects we do here and there. <laughs> and, and, and learn a lot. I mean, I think one, one big insight that just came to me recently as we were talking about kind of this, for the city, the self-interest to act seems so blatantly obvious because a city cannot move very quickly <laughs> it's stuck where it is and and it built in metabolism you know so it's not that it doesn't shift that easily later and time is flying by so quickly so a city that doesn't prepare itself like what are you thinking or as, as we say what are you smoking i mean it's gonna kind of just what the hell is going on and so so the self-interest is clear and still we talk about as if it's because it's a nice a nice deed a noble effort you know even though it's so it's 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 crucially essential and what people then confuse and that's what i realized like when you go back to the individual what, what do you have a self interest as a person it becomes much more complex and i start to liken it you know the the brown movement of 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 like the, the, you know thermodynamics you know thermodynamics of all the molecules moving around you know and it generates temperature The temperature is quite easy to predict and to measure, but you cannot predict all the, the molecules. And that's kind of the situation for each individual. For the individual, it's so complex. Like, how will this hit me? I mean, will, will, will I kind of lose my job? Will my house burn down? Will I not have water? Will, <laughs> will there be a disease? Or like, 
there's so many things and the, the complexity is, is incredible. But if you look at the higher scale, the temperature, like for example, um, um, then um, like compared to the molecule, it, it becomes much more obvious how to act. And I think that's kind of the mental breakthrough is to kind of acknowledge that for individuals, maybe, I mean, it's really at those system level where we have control over because we have city governments, we have country governments, and the trajectory is quite clear because of the the sum of the of the of the, like it's statistical that sometimes looking at the problem bigger it actually becomes simpler because the the, the micro movements kind of average out you know so so you, so the the law of the big numbers in, in some ways and um, how to make that case more clearly and also more empoweringly that's kind of and I wonder. <laughs> That's why I'm talking like, about you because yeah. I want to learn more <laughs> to do that. <laughs> it seems like we have a lot on our plates. That's a <laughs> um, Matisse. We we generally um, ask a last question, which oh. is um, what type of books or articles or movies or something that you've seen or or read uh, recently that you'd like to share with everyone. I'm not sure, like, if, if it's if it's that relevant because I try to kind of read kind of totally out of the <laughs> out no, of the it, box. It, it, so, yeah. so 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 I'm 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 reading kind of a story from a from a defected uh, spy from from Czechoslovakia from the Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> how 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 they're like the how they are trying to see disinformation. You know, and so, so the system of kind of how our information system is breaking apart, and now our technology is even better at kind of how to spread this information. And it's still the same people in power on all sides. So, so kind of how how that works, and and like how can we become? I mean, this is kind of the inspiration why I'm reading it. This is other book from. And how was it called? Your the, this book. I can't even remember. Yeah, I look at this, 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 the, the, the name. I was just like picking it up, and it has, so it's kind of a, like from the Cold War about how spy operations work, and it's so consistent with the time today, like how like how the various powers kind of look at each other. Then I, I, there's a, an Oxford scholar who just wrote the book about extinction. That would have to look. I'm, I'm better at concepts, not at words. So, so, <laughs> so I, would have, I could look up what the name is, and I was stunned. Like, what, what, what drives extinction? It's, it's quite fascinating. Like, that, that, could, will we, what's the odds of humanity surviving? And and he's kind of just worried that the species survives, not the suffering in between as much in the book. And so it's kind of so so. Oh, we don't have bees. That's kind of like that only reduces food production about four percent not that not, it doesn't do us in it's not great but it doesn't do us in so so we don't have to worry about that as much but well, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so there's this inter like by, by making the problem too big and say oh it's a total extinction every everybody goes or not you know and then also the idea we are like our history has barely started we're only 200,000 years old and like so now we just determine the next we have still a billion years of sunshine but I think, I mean, biologically as a species, we're not that stable. So it's really more like about the next 50,000 frame, like year framework, even if, if not shorter, but I mean, like biologically we are like, we shift, you know? So, so who knows how we manifest as life, <laughs> our species in, in the future. So, so I don't think we will be stable for a million years as a species, not like the sharks that have been like this sharks that have been stable for hundred million years, you know? Um, but that's very unique species. Anyhow, so, what, what I'm fascinated by, I'm just more reading is more news articles. It's kind of the, the situation in Afghanistan, I mean, the number of things like the, 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 the kind of the, the, the cult, the, the clash between self-determination, like the, the identity, what, what that drives people. And so even kind of a un, not well-equipped army, like over years of war can still like has to drive to kind of say, we want to be like self-determinant. I mean, I'm just not the ugliness and the blindness of the most amazing apparatuses with like a trillion dollars spent on like on, on the war and 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 it's, it still cannot be fathomed by like the, the powers and it's not just the United States it's also there were the Germans were there the, the Americans were there the French uh, the, the British were there the French were there trying and and 
and could not predict, you know, so, so a, a very simple underlying force. So, so just the psychological implication from that I find fascinating. There are also some psychological books, um, How to Think is a book that I find interesting just as an inspiration, kind of getting more clear about like what makes us tick or reflect upon that. So I can, I, I can write down the titles <laughs> <laughs> and send them to you. <laughs> Please do. I think uh, I'll, I'll add them to the reading list because uh, yeah, we still have sure. a lot to... These are the, 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 yeah. I think do. It's more, more, yeah. The answers are not in the books, but it's in kind of wrestling with the problem every day. Yeah. having well, honest conversations yeah well it, it was it was a very nice one and thanks so much Matisse for taking all your time to well to share what you've learned over the years but also what uh, what you what makes you tick and, and what you will be working on for, for the next years to come um, thanks so much again and thanks again, everyone yeah. Thanks uh, as well to everyone to listening until the end. Don't hesitate to share it with your colleagues and friends and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Ashton.